I started working with the inner city community with disease called lupus, uh, but I kind of recognized right away that it's really important to have leaders from the community who uh, understand that community and have worked with the community uh, to kind of help you navigate your way. And so that's where I think this, this project has really brought us all together. It was a really fun way to um, connect with someone and it, it just really was um, indicative of how the environment was set up for us as um, community people where you just kind of balance the power dynamics. We were just people in that space, which is important so that people can kind of find themselves in the conversation, even if they don't have the educational credentials or expertise. We were just all people. We all got to say what our interests were and what our goals were, and we all had like-minded interests and goals. And through personal experiences or people that we knew, um, or you know, our jobs even, um, knew that the research that we were doing would be really beneficial to the community. And so that's kind of how it worked out. I'm in a couple of other projects that I've done is that we found that uh, people with chronic medical diseases have a huge issue of feeling lonely and kind of uh, socially isolated and that's something I ran by uh, the team members and everybody agreed that that was a major problem and we also recognized doing a literature search that this has not been addressed in kind of communities of color and uh, so we kind of toyed with different uh, you know ideas but we decided okay for the scope of this project let's just answer the first basic question how prevalent is this problem among the inner city community and people, you know, especially people of color with chronic disease. The benefit that community brings to the community-based participatory research is that we have social capital and credibility within our own community. And so you capitalize on that. So Angela reached out to her folks, and um, Dr. Allen reached out to his folks, and I reached out to mine that people know me and willing um, are willing to participate because they, you're operating under the assumption that you um, have their best interests in mind. So they're willing to participate and be vulnerable in that space. We need to kind of survey the community. So um, we partner with um, three organizations that will um, host us per se, where they'll um, use, utilize a survey that we um, have found in the, with their patient population and asking them questions about their levels of loneliness and other quality of life indicators. Um, so, and then we'll just analyze that information. We're also planning on doing some focus groups with some um, identified individuals so that we can kind of get some more qualitative data to, to pair with the quantitative data that we'll get from the surveys. So we can craft a story based on those responses to inform us um, where things land in, in, the, in the black and brown community regarding social isolation and um, loneliness. Another interesting point through our um, literature review, I mean, it's social isolation is recognized as a social determinant of health, but not so much loneliness. And there's a nuanced difference between those two. So it'll be interesting to see what, what comes out regarding that nuanced difference. Thank you to the organizers, I mean, especially Indrani and Joan Cullen, yeah. uh, well, for putting this program together. I really appreciate the collaborative effort between the University of Rochester and the community, um, recognizing that there can be a contentious relationship between the two. I thought it was a great way to bridge those two perspectives in one space, um, to create a sense of unity, and to also develop uh, an experience that can improve the community as a whole.